Hello, my name is Peter Wuchertin. I'm a software architect based in San Francisco. I am here today with my colleague, Yuval Lowy, author of a new book published by Addison Wesley called Writing Software. Uh, Yuval, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Peter. So I'm a software architect. I'm the founder of iDesign, a company devoted for software design. When we say software design, we mean system design and project design. I've had several ideas that are literally the bedrock of current software development, such as microservices, along with several groundbreaking ideas on process and design and technology. I've published uh, seven titles on designing and building software systems and close to 100 articles. I've mentored thousands of architects all over the world in my ideas uh, and techniques. Microsoft recognized me as a software legend uh, as one of the top experts in the world due to the impact I've had on the industry over the years, something they've only uh, recognized six people so far. Uh, before that, in the late 90s, I was the chief architect of a Fortune 100 company in the Silicon Valley, right here, and I managed the architecture department. Before that, I managed groups and projects and designed uh, large systems. I've been designing systems and projects for almost 30 years. So, Yuval, what prompted you to write this book? It's not a secret that the software development industry is in a crisis. In this book, I aim to literally write the industry. The book contains my approach for software design, ideas and techniques that I've been practicing quite successfully across countless of projects for decades now. So you all have read your book, and everyone knows it's impossible to design software upfront. Uh, explain to me why uh, this is our reality. So I completely agree that the way the industry is trying to do it, that is indeed impossible. Okay. What are the common causes that designs don't last? The number one mistake people do when they design software system is they design against the requirements. They literally examine the requirement spec of the system. The system needs to do A and B and C, invoicing, billing, shipping, and they have an A block, a B block, a C block. If you do that, that's basically the kiss of death for the system. And the reason is requirement change. That's actually the nature of requirements. They change. And that's actually a very good thing because the change in the requirements of what keeps all of us employed. You, me, the audience watching this are gainfully employed because of climate change. If requirement would not change, none of us would have a job. And arguably, the more requirements would change, the better off everybody would be because there's so many of them and so few of us, and so the demand for our services would be higher, it would be better off. The problem is, whenever you design against the requirements, when the requirements change, your design will have to change, and that's an incredibly painful thing to do. And as a result, whenever you have to change the design, that's incredibly expensive in time, in, in money, in pain, in frustration. And people literally have now learned to resent change because they design against the requirements. And even if requirements would not change, over time you're going to have new requirements. You're going to have to cancel requirements you already have. And besides, nobody has ever had in the history of software time to completely spec up correctly, upfront, every last requirement of the system. In fact, imagine a project where I would give you on day one a complete set of 300 use cases. Can you really trust it? Are you going to be surprised if the real number is 330? Well, we know that could happen. And what if I give you 300 use cases and the real number is 200? Well, that also could happen, right? But now you're going to be doing 50% more work if you go from 200 to 300. And then there's all the things that the customers themselves don't understand about their own system. So the result is that requirements are, are, are futile. They are just uh, low quality. And if you design against something that's so uh, futile, eventually things break down. So it's literally garbage in, garbage out. If you design against the requirements and you put requirements that are basically garbage into your project, the only thing comes out is indeed garbage. So people now make the logical uh, conclusion that it's impossible to design. Well, I completely agree it's impossible to design that way because if you feed garbage, you get garbage out. You may call it design or not, but that's the end result. I understand why people are resentful of change. Now that I understand the pain, what can we actually do about it? So the, the simple observation is so simple indeed that it's eluded most people their entire career. And the key is you never design against the requirements. Now, I know it goes against what they're doing because they're doing their utmost to transcribe the requirements and convert them to actionable coding items. But that's the worst possible thing you can possibly do. You should never, ever design against the requirements. And in life in general, if you do something that inflicts pain on you, you should probably stop doing it, right? And so, again, to my point that if I give you a book which is full of use cases, which nobody ever has the time to completely spec, 
can you trust it? And the answer is no. It's a steaming pile of manure as far as what, how good it is. That's really, really bad. However, there's some good news here. And the good news is there could be hundreds of use cases, but are they all separate and distinct and unique? Mm. And the answer is no. Most of the use cases and requirements are variation of other use cases and requirements. There's the happy case, the sad case, the incomplete case, the case we're just doing without customer over there. So let's call them core use cases and call the others fluff. Core use cases represents the essence of the business. Core use cases is what bring the customer to the door. Now, it turns out that the nature of the business hardly ever changes. Federal Express is not going to move into ballistic missile control overnight. I mean, it could happen, but in likelihood is not. I mean, its core use case is basically shipping. And so what you need to do is you need to identify the core use cases. And it turns out that even if you have hundreds of use cases, the number of actual core use cases is tiny. In typical systems, we see three, four, maybe five. Six is a really, really high number. I've only seen six once. It was a mega system that had subsystems, and it had dozens of services supporting 120,000 users. I mean, it, it's not a typical system. I encourage the audience uh, at home watching this, look in your own environment, examine the system at the office back at the office right now, and just count on one hand how many truly distinct things you need to do. And it's a small number, one, two, and three. And so what you need to do is identify the core use cases. See, I didn't say ignore the requirements. I said don't design against it. You absolutely need to analyze the requirements, but you need to identify the core use cases. Now, the mission in life of the architect here is to identify the smallest set of building blocks that you can put together to satisfy all of the core use cases. Now, since all the other use cases are variation of the core use cases, what they basically represent now is a different interaction between your building blocks. So now when the requirements change, your decomposition does not. So put differently, if you identify the smallest set of building blocks that you can put together to satisfy all the use cases, since all the use cases except the core variation of the core use cases, what they basically represent is a different interaction between your building blocks, not a different decomposition thereof. Mm -hmm. So now when the requirements change, your design does not. And I call this approach composable design. I said you have to identify the smaller set of building blocks that you can put together to satisfy the core use cases. Now let's try and even identify the order of magnitude. Is it more like t one or 10 or 100 or 1,000? Obviously, a thousand and a hundred is too much of a big number, and if you only have one big component, that's actually a bad design. So the number is about 10. It could be 12, it could be 20, maybe two dozens, but it's not a big number. And the reason it's not a big number is because the factorial of 10 or 12 is already such a huge number, you have enough possible interaction to, to satisfy all the use cases. And by the time you have two dozen components, you have near infinite number of combination, and that even without allowing repetition. If you allow repetition, the number explodes even higher. If you look uh, all around us, that's how most complex systems are put together. For example, in order of magnitude, how many components you have in your body? Is it more like one, 10, 100? And the answer is also 10. Two kidneys, one liver, one heart, one spleen. It's about a dozen components. How many components are in your car? Radiator, water pump. Mm -hmm gas pump, engine block, gearbox, about a dozen. How many components are in your laptop? CPU, graphic card, bus, memory, screen, also about a dozen. So it's a universal concept where you reach a certain number of components, and it's about a dozen or so. The number of combination is so high, you can start satisfying all possible use cases. Like I said, I call this idea composable design. And it's a universal idea about the composability of good designs. Now, to use the human uh, body analogy again, this design was put forward on the plains of Africa about 200,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, I assure you, being a software architect wasn't part of the spec at the time. <laughs> and yet, I'm quite uh, capable of fulfilling that requirement. Now, how could it possibly be that I'm using the same components as a hunter-gatherer from a pre-Neolithic time? And the answer is, while I'm using the same components, I'm putting them together in a different way. Now, the core use case hasn't changed over the last 200,000 years. There's only one core use case, which is survive. Now, the specific use cases, that keeps changing. Now, I also want to point out that the ability to take a small set of components and put them together easily to satisfy any changing requirements and do it quickly and decisively, that's actually the essence of agility. So, Yuval, when was the first time you realized that? It was 1990. In 1990, I was a junior architect 
working on a fairly set of complex systems and projects. And that was the first time I observed that you never design against the requirements. Uh, I observed the idea of composability. Now, it didn't quite gel into the methodology I'm actually showing in the book. That took time. By 1996, I started implementing these ideas on large systems. Towards the end of the 90s, 98 was the first time I actually combined it with project design, so that particular combination. And by 2003, uh, the methodology was ready, and I started practice, practicing it with hundreds of customers uh, all over the world. Now, I, I want to point out that these ideas are incredibly repetitive. They make common sense. Uh, it's not just when I'm doing it. It's basically common sense engineering principles. This is how you would design a laptop or a car or a house for that matter. I understand uh, your composable design and your perspective. Uh, how do you apply the composable design in practice? So let's actually first define what the bar is set. The mission with composable design is to identify the smallest set of building blocks that you can put together to satisfy all requirements, past and future, known and unknown. That's where the bar is set. Nothing less will really do. Because otherwise, at some point, the requirements will change and you visit your design. Now, to identify the smallest set of building blocks, you have to use another methodology, another technique. And I call it volatility-based decomposition. You identify areas of volatility, things that could possibly change in your system. Those you encapsulate in services. And then you implement the required features or the requirements as interaction between these areas of volatility. So when you're doing volatility-based decomposition, you start thinking about your system as a series of vaults. Each vault encapsulates an area of volatility, which is potentially very painful and dangerous. Then a change happens. It changes like tossing a hand grenade into your system. You open up the door of the appropriate vault, toss a hand grenade inside, and close the vault. And the vault does boof. Now, whatever was inside the vault is completely destroyed, but there's no sharpener flying all over the place. And by doing so, you've contained the change. And so the act of identifying the smallest set of building blocks is the act of identifying the areas of volatility in your system. And there's only so many of them, and we can discuss types of volatilities and structure and relationship and so on. But that's the gist of the idea of identifying that smaller set of uh, building blocks. Note that this is very different than designing against the requirements. You design against the requirements and a change happens. Because you design against the requirements, not against change, by definition, the change is everywhere. Now it is like swallowing a live hand grenade, and sharpness is flowing all over the place, and it's very painful. Can you explain to us the typical interactions and relationships between various parts of software? Right. So at the end of the day, we don't design laptops or biological entities or houses. We design software systems. So the first thing you can do is identify typical areas of volatility. What are the typical things that change in software systems? For example, we can talk about clients. Clients are very volatile. You can change the layout, the user experience, the devices. Well, in fact, nothing else changes in your system. But the other thing that's volatile in a software system is the behavior itself. If you look at the required behavior, that itself can be a sequence of activities. And I can keep the same activities but change the sequence. So the sequence is volatile. But I can also keep the sequence and change the activities. So we've got two separate type of volatilities in the requirements themselves. We've got sequence volatility and activity volatility. Since everything that's volatile we encapsulate, we put those in separate boxes. Then you've got resources. The software doesn't operate in the void. The software manipulates resources. Could be databases, queues, other systems. Now, there's many possible ways of accessing any resource. So even the access itself is volatile. So we encapsulate that. Then there's a whole world of utilities, things that your software needs to do as far as logging, diagnostic, instrumentation, security, communication. And there's so many ways of doing security, or a message bus, or communication. And so those are volatile. We encapsulate those. So I've developed a methodology for identifying the typical areas of volatility. Then you identify a structure you can put on top. For example, here's how the flow of the use case, given the volatility as I just described, should propagate. And then on top of that, you put rules of interaction. And the rules say this kind of part of the system can only talk to that part of the system. And what all of these structures and rules allow you to do is allow the design to converge very quickly. It's like running through a funnel that design uh, emerges at the end. Um, this is all great. How long does this take? So it actually doesn't take long to do it. With practice, you can do it quite decisively and deterministically in a matter of a few days. Now, you may have to spend several months getting to the point you can spend a few days on it. And that's typically most design effort. For example, if you want to build your dream house up uh, in the country on a hill, you have to spend several decades finding the right life partner and amassing the capital or the earning capacity. But then the architect can spend a week designing your house. 
So it's not as extreme as that, but it's of that flavor. You have to spend several months truly identifying the core uh, uh, use cases and identifying the volatilities and such. But once you've got that going, the design itself is done in a matter of days. Just to make sure, we are all talking about the architecture here. We're not talking about the detail design, correct? Uh, Pedro, that's a very good question. There's a huge distinction between architecture and detail design. Most people don't separate it. For them, it's just one continuous design spectrum. Architecture is the big decomposition into blocks of the system. Detail design is the shape uh, and flavor of those things. For example, a mouse and an elephant have exactly the same architecture. The detail design is somewhat different. And so what we're talking here only works because we're talking about architecture, not about detail design. There's still significant effort on detail design that you can do at the scope of individual components. You can do it up front. You can do it on the go. You can do it in batches. There's lots of ways of uh, skinning this. But at the end of the day, we're talking about just architecture here. So you all, how long does system design this way actually last? The short answer is forever. Now, forever is a very strong word, and so I have to qualify it. It's good until the nature of the business changes. Remember, this whole thing is predicated on the core behavior of the business. Most businesses change at glacial pace. They change very slowly. Maybe over decades, Federal Express will move into ballistic missile control. But it's just unlikely. So what you actually get is as long as the nature of the business doesn't change, your architecture is good forever. In fact, I have system I put into production more than 20 years ago. And technologies came and went, and they changed the details. But the architecture is still good. It's still a goose that lays golden egg. And that's the essence of a good design. Good design has to withstand the test of time. One of the reasons I set on these ideas for almost 20 years is because I didn't want to rush it. Uh, the ultimate test of any architecture is time. Mm. I had to make sure these things indeed work. <laughs> well, thank you, Val, for your time. And hopefully this inspires our industry to change and write that software. So thank, thank you. you.